Hello everybody, it's Wyvern here with another bit of Total War, Warhammer 2, Quake cool Magic gameplay. This time around we are on the map, uh, the Tower of Hoeth, for a bit of Tomb King against Vampire Counts gameplay. This is, of course, the classic grudge match between undead factions, and uh, definitely, obviously, with the uh, intro of uh, Tomb Kings, I'm, there's been a whole bunch of ups and downs, nobody's entirely sure where they fit into the meta and how things are, so uh, definitely uh, the list we're seeing are very interesting things, and in this situation I felt comfortable enough to give it Central the Imperishable a run, and uh, Central the Imperishable is one of those lords who was very expensive to run, and generally, of course, you will see Kalida. Personally, I think Ark in the Black is my favorite lord out of the, all the Tomb King lords. I think he's the best, but generally you will see Kalida uh, being fielded, and uh, regardless of which you prefer, definitely Cetra is not on, not the most preferred or most popular lords. However, I do think that against the Vampire Counts, he could perform pretty well, because you can put him on this War Sphinx, which gives him pretty ludicrous stats. 110 armor, almost 8k HP, passable melee stats with a significant bonus against infantry of 15. Uh, speed of 68, charge bonus of 80, so absolutely monstrous, and even against large targets, he can do a lot of damage with that raw armor piercing work. He does, of course, have the uh, lore of Nehekara for, cast for casting, uh, which does give him, in this situation, I did give him three different spells. I gave him the uh, Osep's Incantation of Desiccation. Uh, of course, these names are kind of ridiculous. It's very hard for me to pronounce them, but I will do my best. Uh, you can see they, it's a pretty crazy debuff to melee attack and melee defense. Uh, that is, however, very expensive in Winds of Magic. Second spell here is Usirian's Incantation of Vengeance, which is a direct damage spell, much akin to something like Fate of Buna, though I do believe it is a fair bit less powerful. Uh, however, it is, or maybe perhaps I suppose the more comparable would be a super roided Melkosmus to find my asthma. Then we do have the Nero's Incantation of Protection which is a very cheap physical resistance buff. Otherwise, uh, I do have the Crown of Nakara, which is an AoE armor piercing uh, and weapon damage and charge bonus buff, which is going to synergize very nicely with the way my army's main damage dealers are built currently. He also does have Unyielding Will, which is plus 5 melee attack and, and melee defense for all nearby allies. Uh, great little uh, buff, or creates a pretty significant buff for these undead lackeys. The rest is dead, so whenever I'm casting, I will get a mini Invocation of the Heck effect. And then, of course, he does have a curse when he drops below 50% HP, causing a small fate of Buna effect around him. Uh, the Blessed Blade of Tra, which allows him to blind enemies for 43 seconds for another massive debuff, and finally the Wrath of Trial, which is an AoE explosion uh, knockback to help him get clear of bad situations. So I do apologize, for, apologize, this is going to be a bit of a lengthy uh, beginning, and hopefully things will start uh, being faster as we, as the Tomb Kings become a more common faction and uh, everyone gets used to it. Alongside him, I did bring an Ecrotect. I think this is almost a must-have lord or hero to bring for the Tomb Kings, uh, and even if you don't really bring too many constructs, and usually you will bring at least a few. The Vambraces of the Sun are amazingly powerful. Minus 9 melee attack is so very, very good. Uh, and especially against Vampire Counts with their, other, their lower melee stats, this is a very significant buff. He also does have Restore for that heal, and because in this situation he will be fighting amidst his constructs on the front lines, I did decide to bring Wrath of the Creator, which is a boost of armor piercing and damage and melee attack. And this is very significant for Ushapti, who have a baseline melee attack of 23. It does mean that they'll be brought up to 28, and then of course with the boost from Cetra, they're up to 33. My front line is composed entirely of skeleton warriors. These guys are dirt cheap. I just meant to kind of absorb my opponent's troops. They will not do well against Graveguard, but for example, if they are f facing off against the skeleton warriors, and of course with the, bu the enemy skeleton warriors in this situation, they will just hold out just fine, especially with the buffs coming in from Cetra uh, and uh, all that sort of stuff. In the back line, I do have two units of Tomb Guard with Halberds just to shut down enemy large, because of course I was a little worried that my opponent could bring Blood Knights or units like that, and I felt that for my large lord here, as well as for the Necro Sphinx, it would be useful to simply uh, shield them in the blob of a uh, Tomb Guard. For my main damage component to take the enemy front line, I do have a unit of Ush three units of Ushapti, who I am hoping can go toe to toe with basically anything shy of Crypt Horrors. These guys do not have region, but of course they have very high armor, they have very solid melee uh, defense, and, and pretty good we uh, weapon strength, so it's definitely th tear through lower end infantry like Skeleton Warriors in seconds. Finally here we do have the Sphinx of Usef, which is a Necro Sphinx with magical fire and fire damage, and of course monster stats that are made even more ridiculous by its proximity to Cetra the Imperishable, and of course the Necrotect with their AoE buffs. Uh, one of the cool things of course about the Sphinx of Usef is that fire damage means it's going to be doing 25% more damage to a lot of the large units that the Vampire Counts tend to bring. Vargulfs, Crypt Horrors, and Terrorgeists all have regeneration and the associated 25% uh, weapon strength. Our 25% uh, damage uh, susceptibility to fire. For my opponent, he de decided to go with a very interesting and very sort of mono build uh, style. And for his lord, he did bring Manfred von Karstein, who is of course a very solid no matter what. Spirit Leech, of course the Tomb Kings don't have a great sustain. Um, 
even with the Necrotech's help. And of course, the Necrotech can't actually heal Cetra, so if my opponent decides to Spirit Leech Cetra, he can get some good value there. He does have the Sword of Unholy Power, as well as Master of Black Arts, for to get the best out of his uh, power reserves. Wind of Death, which can annihilate my front line. And finally, Invocation of Neck for those crazy heals. Manfred himself is a decent melee combatant, though I would definitely not make not try to put him up against the might of the uh, Sphinx of Usef, which will tear him through shreds in a matter of seconds. On the ground, he does have a White King backing his front line with that as Encourage, as well as just good melee stats, uh, and a Corpse Cart with Unholy Lodestone, providing regen, as well as the uh, Vigor Mortis for plus 5 melee attack and defense. His front line is composed entirely of veteran up Skeleton Warriors, who will be able to most likely beat my Skeleton Warriors, but will not be able to crush through Shopti with their high armor. And for that, my opponent has brought several units of Blood Knights, four to be exact, three of them hidden in the woods, and these guys should be able to annihilate through Shopti, and if they are able to get on top of... Uh, either the Sphinx of Usep and kind of isolate it, or on top of Cetra and isolate him, they will be able to bring him down despite his high armor. Uh, the Blood Knights are just a very, very potent anti-large unit. That said, I do have these two units of Tomb Guard with Halberds, who have rather monstrous stats for their price. At f they are very, very cheap. They only cost 850. They do provide armor piercing, anti-large, 47 melee defense, which puts them in the ballpark of units such as Chosen with Halberds, uh, Phoenix Guard even. On a, Phoenix Guard, I do believe, sits at 52 when their uh, Martial m Mastery is activated. Uh, so these guys are definitely well in the ballpark of other elite anti-large troops, as far as melee defense is concerned, and that should allow them to really contest enemy heavy cap. As you can see, our, we're kind of taking our time. Neither of us has artillery, so we're not really able to pressure the other into making a move. And so what we're kind of doing here is posturing and just trying to get a bit of a bit of an angle on our opponent and just trying to scout out what, what our opponent's brought. My opponent is slowly but surely now we're going to start moving his Blood Knights forward, who are still unspotted because they are in the thick woods here. And I really didn't want to engage there because that is, of course, I'm very reliant on my uh, constructs. So as you can see here, the Skeleton Warriors are going in. Of course, neither of us really wants to be fighting in the woods because our, uh, most of our powerhouse units are, of course, large. And as you can see, the Skeletons are engaging. And with Ushapti in the fray, the enemy Skeleton Warriors are not going to be long for this world. You can see I also do push in the Sphinx of Usep, which I was earlier using to zone away these Blood Knights. And I'm going to commit it here just to do some damage to the Skeleton Warriors. Here in my back line, I'm simply trying to zone my opponent away with Tomb, tomb Guard with Halberds. One of the cool things about these guys is, of course, that they will not rout. They have and now as my opponent does charge in with Blood Knights, getting a mini re re rear charge on my Skeleton Warriors, my Tomb Guard will be able to collapse on him, cause some significant hurt, especially with Cetra coming in to help. Uh, these guys will simply get stripped down and brought to heal very, very quickly. And you can see Cetra uh, just doing a great job already, and as are these Tomb Guard with Halberds. You can see shortly their uh, experience is going to start spiking. Of course, my opponent has gotten a huge amount of kills here as he casts a beautiful Wind of Death, annihilating my entire front line of Skeletons, or a vast majority of it, and uh, doing a little bit, a tiny bit of damage to the uh, Shopti. Uh, however, the Shopti will still be able to do just fine against the Skeleton Warriors, and you can see here the White King is definitely being driven down. The Necrotech is still, of course, providing that critical support in the front line, and you can see some of the Blood Knights are definitely being driven into the muck here by the Tomb Guard, which is racking up kills, and it's almost reached uh, gain to Chevron. Over here, this Tomb Guard has yet to be committed, though finally I'm going to start committing it here against the White King, as well as Manfred, uh, who are surrounding the Shopti. I do get my Necrotech a little bit clear, because I don't want him getting assassinated, and you can see over here the Sphinx of Usef just dishing out amazing amounts of hurt. But as you can see, Cetra does get jumped by those Blood Knights, and they are doing immense amounts of work. You can see they've already stripped him down by about a th over a thousand HP, and uh, they are well on their way to destroy him completely. Uh, of that, that because of this, I will be forced to pull Cetra out and try to get him clear of the fray uh, into a much safer position. Over here, you can see I've my Realm of Souls has finally completed casting, which will allow me to summon an additional unit of Ushapti, who I will shortly put on the field. Over here on the right flank, you can see the Blood Knights managed to shroud and slaughter the two units of Ushapti over there. Uh, and as you and uh, now they are going to be plowing into the Tomb Guard with Halberds. That said, the Tomb Guard with Halberds is going to be absolutely monstrous here, and you can see I've hit my opponent with a debuff with Usef's Incantation of Desiccation, which nukes down his melee attack and makes him much more susceptible to getting shredded by the angry, angry Tomb Guard. Over here, uh, you can see that the Tomb Guard is up to, again, has gained a chevron, about a one and a half chevrons already, and uh, they are well on their way to getting another. Over here, the Sphinx of Usef zoning away my opponent, and you can see uh, Cetra the Imperishable has popped the plus plate of just to get that crazy uh, blind. Over here, in the heart of the fray, you can see the Shopti are getting torn apart by the Blood Knights, but of course they do hit rather hard because they, of course, have that uh, very, very, very strong hit. Uh, hitting power with the armor piercing. Of course, the Blood Knights will still tear them down, but the Blood Knights, and of course, they do have pretty good melee defense in comparison to what the Ushapti do, but every now and then, uh, those hits will go through and cause some work. Where you can see the Tomb Guard stripping down these Blood Knights, bring them down to the sides. Uh, these guys have already gained a chevron themselves, and they're definitely doing some monstrous amounts of work. Over here, the Skeleton Warriors will get wiped out by the Ushapti, and over here, of course, the two Sphinxes will be more than enough to zone away this single unit of Blood Knights, and my opponent is really starting to uh, run low. His Blood Knights are very much committed here against Ushapti. You can see the balance of power is still rather even, uh, but he has not been able to assassinate any of my lords, and that's definitely been fortunate for me. 
has his final kind of bog standard troops here, the Skeleton Warriors, are getting slaughtered. Uh, of course, the Shapti, which are intended to deal with units such as Graveguard, are absolutely monstrous against units such as Skeleton Warriors. Now here on the flank, you can see Setra as well as the uh, Sinks of Usef are going to plow into the back of the Corpse Cart with Unholy Holy Lodestone, just trying to bring it down and get rid of that plus 5 boost it's providing to all nearby units. Uh, they are very well suited for this sort of task, as they just dish out so much hurt. The Blood Knights do try to commit, but of course, uh, Usetra is kind of shielded here by the Tomb Guard. He is shielded a bit by the Ushapti, who are still around kicking. And of course, the Tomb Guard is just dragging down my opponent's troops, slowly but surely pulling him into the muck. Over here, the Necrotect, of course, still providing his buffs. Uh, and you can see there is, of course, melee ta damage being improved on the Tomb Guard, simply because of their proximity to Cetra and his buffs. I do, however, pop an Arrow's Incantation of Protection on Cetra, just trying to keep him alive. Definitely a little worried that if the Blood Knights get a good surround, they could bring him down and uh, end his life here. Uh, kind of overreacting, but uh, definitely definitely something you want to be watch out for, because he is not invulnerable, in spite of being very, very tanky. Over here, the Necro, the, uh, Necro Sphinx dragging my opponent's troops down to the muck. You can see over here the Tomb Guard, of course, up the, well up the two, two and a half chevrons now, and still doing fine. Uh, these are similar with the Tomb Guard over here. Both Tomb Guard have basically gained two chevrons in the course of the battle, and they're absolutely massacring these Blood Knights. Over here, you can see Cetra just plowing through these Blood Knights. The uh, Sphinx he's on is just so impressive. It looks really pretty awesome. You can see it just kind of sparking and... Uh, doing and just doing some crazy work here. Uh, you can see the Blood Knights being hit by the AoE damage attack from or damage ability from Cetra because of course uh, he has dropped below 50% HP and it just strips those knights very very quickly. You can see they're losing HP at an astron astronomical rate. Sphinx of Usep is in the parade to help and at this point my opponent has been reduced just White King as well as uh, Manfred and he does decide to end the game there. So definitely a very tight match, a uh, very close match, definitely a Pyrrhic victory. My opponent got a great wind of death which annihilated most of my front line of skeletons. Uh, perhaps that would have been better used on against the Tomb Guard because they were did end up being the unit that the, that really clutched that game for me. Uh, had my only anti-large solutions really been the Sphinx of Usef and Citra the Imperishable, it is likely, and of course he's not a dedicated anti-large, then it is likely I would not have been able to win. Those two Tomb Guard definitely did, paid their weight in gold uh, when they dragged down some multiple units of Blood Knights and uh, slaughtered them to a man. Skeleton Warriors, nothing too fancy. The Ushap did an amazing job. Really, I was expecting my opponent to bring Graveguard because I do believe in a straight-up fight, the two, uh, the Vampire Kens can easily out-infantry the Grave the um, Tomb Kings. So I was expecting some Graveguard, and I figured the Ushapti would be a good counter to those. Uh, so I was definitely caught by a little by surprise by the, so many Skeleton Warriors. Uh, in that situation, it was much more balanced, but the Ushapti definitely did some monstrous work there in the pits. Uh, some of them, of course, did get surrounded and massacred by Blood Knights. Uh, for as far as the rest of it, the Sphinx of Usef, it's important to keep in mind what units were dying here. For example, the Sphinx of Usef was largely killing Blood Knights for a lot of that game, uh, as was Cetra. So definitely the kill counts, I think, were a little misguiding, or, um, and definitely very, very powerful there. For my opponent, his Skeleton Warriors, obviously nothing fancy. An amazing wind of death for Manfred meant that he got a lot of kills. Uh, the Blood Knights actually did some pretty significant work, but once again, killing units that were of fairly low significance, except for the Ushapti, of course. Uh, and of course, I did get a free cast of Ushapti as well, which is something to keep in mind. That is about 900 gold worth of units. It's sort of like Morgur getting his free Chaos spawn. Um, so definitely very, very potent there. Uh, I definitely don't think this was a bad build. Definitely a little single... Focus orient a single uh, orient single orientation or single uh, mono build sort of uh, with just a anvil of skeletons backed by a horde of blood knights, but it was still a very potent combination that almost brought this comp to its knees were it not for the tomb guard with halberds. Definitely one of the benefits of tomb guard with halberds, besides being very cheap for the stats they provide, is the fact that they are unbreakable. Um, of course, being undead, they will simply not route when you, they get rear charged. A lot of other uh, infantry units especially in this kind of armor range of about 50 armor, if they get a rear charged by a horde of blood knights, chances are they would sha they would break and run. Of course, the Tomb Guard do not do that. They stick around to the bitter end, and so they're really capable of dragging down large units in the muck if they overcommit and overstay their welcome. Definitely, though, great game to my opponent, Vincent Van Smog. Uh, I do hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like and subscribe down below to keep up with additional content. Uh, as usual, guys, uh, if you have any comments, criticism, anything like that, you'd like to post up, be sure to put it down in the comment section. I will respond as soon as I can. I do appreciate you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Wyvern out.